just want to uh, come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we pray that, Lord, you would still our hearts. We thank you that you are the living God. And we thank you for your word, Lord, that it's not the word of wise men, but it is the word of the living God. We thank you that, Lord, your word is more up-to-date, more relevant than tomorrow's newspapers. And we pray that, Father, as we look into your word and as we be led by your spirit, Lord, that you would speak to us, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word. We pray that we may not be hearers of the word only, but that we may be doers, that we may put into practice what you speak to us this morning. Lord, I pray that as I speak, that you would lead and guide the words, and that, Lord, you and you alone will be glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, you might be surprised or even shocked to see me standing out here, but I can assure you that all the exit doors are blocked, and you, you cannot run away. You have to suffer it. I want to begin by thanking Jamie for giving me the opportunity of sharing the pulpit. Um, I was working it out the other day that it was 12 and a half years since I last preached here, so it just shows you how bad it must have been. And it, it might be another 12 and a half years before he asks me again, or he might even leave, I don't know. I want to uh, just begin by looking back, because I think I've got more to look back on than I have to look forward to. Um, and 50 years ago, I was in the, the Good Baptist College of Bristol, um, and one of the things that we had to do there was that occasionally we had to cross the Seven River, the Seven Bridge, and we had to go into Wales and preach. And I'm not sure how they managed to suffer us, but they did. We went up these valleys to these huge churches, small congregations, but they were very faithful people. And there was one particular church that uh, we used to go to, and the first thing the church secretary would say to us before he said, have you had a nice journey or how are you? He would always say to us, have you brought your notes? And we wondered why he said this. And one day, one of the students was brave enough to ask him, why do you say, have you brought your notes? And he said, well, if you brought your notes, there's a beginning and there's an end. <laughs> if you haven't brought your notes, there's a beginning, but, well, there you go. Good news, I brought my notes. Bad news, I can hardly see them. <laughs> so there's no, no knowing when you're going to get home. But I want to ask Simon, first of all, just to come and share with us the first uh, reading that we're looking at this morning. Good. Acts chapter 2, verses 17 to 24. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit. And they shall prophesy, and I will grant wonders in the sky above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man 
attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held by its power. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you. You will know that those uh, verses were spoken, of course, at uh, Pentecost. And uh, this was Peter speaking to the crowds. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your boys, your sons and your daughters, they will prophesy. Your young men will have visions and your old men will dream dreams. And I guess, beloved, that when I look at this passage, I immediately fall into the last department, your old men dreaming dreams. And maybe some of you would uh, join me there, uh, there as well. But one interpretation, one understanding of this verse is that old men will look back on their lives and remember the faithfulness of God, will remember the things that God has done. And young men will look forward in anticipation to all that God can do and will do in their lifetimes. So that's what I'm doing this morning. I'm first of all looking back, and then I'm looking at the present, and then I'm going to be looking at the future. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Going back to the remembrance of uh, Bristol College, I remember that when I was there, there, the course came to an end, and it was with fear and trepidation that um, I thought, well, I'm leaving the safety of the college, and I have to actually go out and not only work, but I have to look after a church. And possibly some of those in the church know a lot more about the Bible than I do. They know a lot more. They have greater experience. And I had fear and trepidation. And God spoke and gave me a verse, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. I have not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, power, and self-control. And that verse has stayed with me even up till today. I have not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and and self-control. So we looked for a church, and we got uh, called to several churches in Bristol, but we felt that we needed to go to India. We had a real burden for a church in India, a church that we knew about. It was a large church, uh, which again filled me with fear and trepidation, a a church, not a Baptist church, but a, a church of North India. It had a bishop, and it had bells and smells and all that kind of stuff as well. The, there, it was a, a mission school, and there were about seven or 800 children and 300 staff, so a very large church to look after. And everything went well for the first year, but during the course of the second year, something began to go wrong. Well, I thought so anyway. And that was that the children down in the playground and around the school started speaking and singing in tongues. And I have absolutely no idea what was going on. I was the minister, and I had no clue. And the missionaries came running to me, asking me what to do and what is this, and I had no idea what was happening. And I got my book out. I don't know if you can go back that far. Dennis Bennett, um, 9 o'clock in the morning, and I was frantically reading through this book, trying to find out what was going on. But... It was amazing what was going on, and I want to share a bit of that with you because it has a point to it. But one one day, for example, the the school bell went, and the children should have come out onto the playground, about four or five hundred of them at that time, and there were no children. And myself and the teachers went to look for where the children were. They were gathered in a church in the big school hall. And all these children were gathered there from the age of about 7, 8, up to 18. 
And up on the stage was a boy, age 12, a Tibetan boy, uh, with a Buddhist background, but a Christian. I will pour out my flesh and my spirit on all flesh. And he was preaching from the book of Revelation. And I have never, ever heard it being preached like that. So much so that when the 10-minute break was to finish, the bell didn't go. The teacher stayed at the back, stood at the back, and he preached and he preached and he preached for an hour on the book of Revelation. A 12-year-old boy. And then there was a girl called Rebecca. She was a Muslim girl. And she felt the Lord come upon her. There, there was over this, over this area sort of a, a, a cloud, a, a warmth, a, something over the whole hillside. And we knew it was the presence of God, but we didn't, it was nothing to do with me. And this girl, Rebecca, she was a Muslim girl. And she felt the Lord come upon her, and, and she gave her life to the Lord She had spent a long time in hospital because she suffered from epilepsy, but she wanted to get baptized. And the doctor said, no, you cannot be baptized. You've got epilepsy. No, she insisted, I want to be baptized. She was baptized and never had epilepsy again. There was an Anglo-Indian boy, a Catholic boy, in hospital all his life using oxygen. He had a hole in his heart. And he felt that the Lord was healing him as well. And he he said to the doctor, I want to walk up the mountainside. Doctor said, that's impossible, you can't. But he did. He came back and they did a scan, no hole in the heart. There was a lady called Mrs. George from South India, one of the teachers, who literally came out of Luke chapter 8. She was a woman with an issue of blood and for 12 years as well. And she covered, she carried this Um, cloth around with her and she was always bleeding she had a horrible smell about her and God touched her and healed her there was a a boy I could go on for hours but I won't promise Um, there was a boy who was going back home got caught in a storm sheltered underneath the tree whilst it was raining and he heard a voice saying to him get down on your knees and give your life to me he was a Hindu boy and he gave his life to Jesus And we saw young people leading their teachers to the Lord. Amazing. So many of the teachers became Christians because of their their students. There was no discipline problems. There were no... uh, In the evenings, the, the children would leave their cottages and go down into the school to do their homework. They did their homework. And at the end of their homework, they would be sitting there singing in tongues and, and worshipping the Lord. And it was, it was quite unbelievable. All this was going on. No discipline problems at all. We came to the end of the school year and children had to go back to their, their homes, uh, back to Hindu families and back to all different kinds of families. And, and much happened whilst they were on holiday uh, away. I, I will tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But when they came back, and some of them were not allowed to come back because they were Hindu families, when they came back, the revival continued. It went on. And people were being converted and it was reaching out and it had absolutely nothing to do with me or the, or the missionaries. It was happening. And the kids were doing it themselves. Well, the lesson that I get from this, the first lesson is that, and it's an important lesson for us, is that God is able to do far more than we expect. You know, I'm not telling you about something that I read about. I'm telling you about something we saw. And I know how much we are missing in the West, how much we are missing in our individual lives, how much we're missing in the church. God can do so much more. And the second thing I learn about this is that that revival happened because of the faithfulness of praying people. That prayer does change things. And the result of people praying and praying and praying was that we saw these things happening. And the third thing that I would want to encourage you with is don't give up planting seeds. You never know. You you plant the seeds and, and years and years later, you may have the blessing of seeing them come to fruit. Last October, Joyce and I were invited to go back to this place after many years Uh, just to see what was happening. And the student that uh, invited me back, 
is a very high-ranking um, officer in, in, uh, in the Indian government, very high. And he invited us back. Now, when he was in school, he was very, very keen for the Lord. But he's gone away from the Lord. And so I sat down with him and I said, what has happened to you? Why, why have you done this? What's, what's gone on? And he said, oh, you brainwashed me. You, you, you convinced me. And then I reminded of him of healings and different things that we had seen and he had experienced. And he had to admit, yeah, that wasn't brainwashing. Um, we had the opportunity of talking to his son, but his wife was a doctor. And she was a Buddhist doctor. And we went, uh, whilst we were staying with them, we went to her family. And that, her sister was also a doctor. And she was suffering very badly with stomach, guts in her stomach, something wrong with her stomach. She'd had x-rays and, and everything was wrong with her. And she had to, she's a doctor, she had to fly down to the south of India to see a specialist. She had these x-rays with her, she had everything else. And while she was telling us this, I just felt pray for her. So we grabbed her by the hand and dragged her into the next room, closed the door behind us. When we got in there, we found out we were in a Buddhist shrine. There were Buddhas and flags and everything else. But I said to her, we're going to pray in the name of Jesus that, God, that you will be healed. And two days later, she went down to the south of India and showed her x-rays and everything else. The doctor could find nothing wrong with her. Totally healed, totally healed. And I, I share this with you, beloved, because expect great things from a great God. Expect great things. I think for me, the greatest um, joy was to see that five or six of those that we led to the Lord are now full-time pastors. And some of them are living in areas where there is much persecution. So let me move on there. We've been looking back. I want to now look to the present and the future. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. What's this last days thing all about? I mean, Joel said the last days 2,600 years ago. Peter talked about the last days 2,000 years ago. We're still, we're still talking about the last days. What are these last days and why do they last so long? Why aren't we coming to the end of these last days? And I think, beloved, that we need to remember that God's timing is not the same as ours. He doesn't use time the same as we use time. You remember in Psalm 90, it says that a thousand years, our thousand years, is like one day to God. I mean, quite a thought comes to my mind. That means in God's calendar, Jesus was walking the earth just two days ago. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, but his timing is not the same as our, our timing. And the reference to last days is a reference to events rather than timing. Jesus said in, in Luke 12, verse 28, when you see these things happening, know that I am at the door. And the last days, beloved, are days that are related to events rather than to timing. When you see these things happening, know that the Lord's time, the return is there. What things? Well, in Matthew chapter 24, in Luke chapter 12, uh, 21, and Paul and Peter talk about, in the last days, wars and rumors of wars and famines and, and, and earthquakes and, and so on. And you might say, well, we've always had wars. We've always had famines. We've always had climate change. We've always had persecution. But when Jesus spoke about this, beloved, he was talking about the speeding up. He likened it to a woman that was pregnant. And as she came to her time of confi confinement, so the, the pains came faster and faster, more and more and more intense. And this is what he's talking about here. Not just a war, but war upon war upon war upon war. Famine upon famine upon famine upon famine. I heard yesterday on Sky News that there are more people starving today than ever in our history. And you know, climate change. Today, they are expecting in Death Valley in California to record a heat of 55 degrees, the hottest ever recorded here upon Earth. 
And Jesus said, when you see these things happening, know that I am at the door. In other words, beloved, be ready. Be ready. And we need to ask ourselves, are we ready? Now, those are the general kind of things, but there are also some specific prophecies. Like the woman who is pregnant has pains, 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 but when her water bursts, that's, that's a sure sign that something is about to happen, and it only happens once. And there are a number of prophecies in the Bible which talk about when you see this happening, that's it, put a tick next to it. One of them, I share a few with them, one of them is Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 4 and 8. I find this an amazing it's talking about an alliance in the last days between three nations. And according to which reference Bible you read, uh, it talks about Og and Magog, or it talks about the north, the country in the north, or the country in the south. It talks about the bear and the leopard and Turbul. And the bear, like the lion, is the symbol of England. The bear is the symbol of Russia, and it always has been. And it says when you see the the alliance between the bear and the leopard, and the leopard is the symbol of Iran, and Turbul is Turkey, when you see this alliance, know that I am at the door. That alliance, beloved, was signed 18 months ago. That alliance between Russia, Iran, and Turkey was signed 18 months ago. The prophecy in Ezekiel is particularly talking about Israel. But there it is. I I give you another one. Revelation 9, verse 16. You can put a tick, tick a tick a pook, pook a tick. Put a tick next to this one as well. There will be in the east a standing army of two hundred thousand men. A standing army in the east. Right? Let's identify China. They will march from China into Europe. The Silk Road, Marco Polo's road, was completed. The link between China and Europe was completed last year. You can now travel from one end to the other without any problem. Visas, of course, but the road is there. And, and uh, that is another one that you can put a tick next to. Another one, Return of Israel to its own land. After 2,000 years, Israel came back to its own land. There is no other record in human history of a land being, of a nation being away from its land for so long and then coming back to its own land. Hebrew. There's a prophecy about Hebrew being used again. Hebrew was not used for 2,000 years, but now it's a living language again. And there are many other prophecies, beloved, that, that, that are being fulfilled in our time. Here's a statistic I like. The second coming of Christ is mentioned 1,845 times in the Bible. 1,845. Eight times more than the first coming. Do you think God is trying to tell us something? Yeah? The first coming second coming. The second coming is foretold in the Bible eight times more than the first coming. In fact, it is the second largest theme in the New Testament. The largest theme in the New Testament is salvation. But the second largest is the second coming of Christ. And what this is saying, beloved, is be ready. And Peter asked the question, and I'm going to come to our second reading now. Peter asked the question, When you see these things happening, what kind of people ought we to be? How should I take these signs, not just listen to them on a Sunday and then go out and forget them, but how should I allow the reality of these signs to change my life, to motivate my life, to give me purpose? How should I focus the rest of my life as a result of what I'm seeing happening all the way around me? And Peter, uh, Simon's going to come and read that answer to us from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 to 18, please.
But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed, destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do. Also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. Thank you. Bless you. We move now from... Uh, the past to the present and to the future. And I think the first thing that we need to say is that we need to be careful that we don't sleepwalk into the future. We don't sleepwalk into the future. We need to be alert. We need to be awake. There is spiritual warfare going on. And we need to be aware of it. We need to know our Bibles. We need to be praying. We need to be on our knees. And Peter asked the question, when you see these things happening, what kind of people ought we to be? And he gives a number of answers. Verse 11 and verse uh, 14, he says, we should seek holiness. We should seek after walking holy with the Lord. That means, beloved, no secret sins. And so often we can, as Christians, put on an outward show. We can look okay from outside, but inwardly. We pop home and watch the pornography on the television, or we watch this, or we watch that. We have lust. We have all the problems that we shouldn't be having. And you say, but how can I, how can I sort that out? God calls us to be holy even as he is holy, and he wouldn't call us to be holy unless it was possible. So how is it possible? He gives to us his spirit, not his spirit, but his Holy Spirit. He puts his Holy Spirit within me and he teaches me how to resist the devil. And I need to learn how to do that, beloved. I need to say no. I need not to say, oh, God understands, he knows my weaknesses, da, 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 da. God calls me to be holy. He calls me to be holy. And he expects me to be holy. He fills me with his Holy Spirit. And there's, the enemy has no better weapon than being the world being able to point to us and saying, look at these hypocrites, these Christians. They say one thing, they do another. We are meant to be seen to be different. Let me say that again. We are meant to be seen to be different. What kind of people ought we to be? Verse 13 says that we should be aware of our destiny. We should know where we are. We should be we should prepare ourselves and we shouldn't compromise with the world that we live in. I was reading the other day in 2 Kings 17 that Israel was quite satisfied with itself. It was following God. But this thing God had against them, that although they were following God, they also allowed all that was around them to compromise them, to come into their lives, to be a part of their faith. And God doesn't want us to compromise. He wants us to be holy even as he is holy. Why? Because we are in spiritual warfare. 
What kind of people ought we to be? Verse 9 and 15 reminds us that we need to use our time to witness. Why? Because there is a heaven, but there's also a hell. And there's no alternative between one and the other. We need to tell people that they need Christ. Romans 10 verse 14 asks the question, how will they know unless we tell them? We need to tell them. We need to show them. We may not have gone to college. We may not be very clever with our, uh, our, our Bibles, but God's promise is that if we will open our mouths, he will fill it. We can tell them not only by speaking to them, but we can tell them by our testimonies, by the way that we live our lives. And the question, of course, is do we? Or do we leave it up to Jamie to do it all? Do we share our faith? Do we speak to others? Do we live Christ? What kind of people ought we to be? Verse 17 reminds us that we need to be steadfast in a changing world, in a worsening situation. And it doesn't need me to tell you in recent, in recent um, days how things are going not only in our own country but right the way around the world. I was reading in, in Esther 4 this morning, maybe we were born for such a time as this. Yeah, maybe we were born for such a time as this. God has a purpose to use you. God wants you to speak out. God wants to use you. As I see these things happening, I don't despair. I don't give up. Why? Because God is in control. God has foretold us that these things will happen. God has told us 2,000 years ago in his Bible, and we're seeing it happening. It's more up to date than tomorrow's newspaper. It's happening. And as I see it happening, I don't panic, and I don't get a white flag out and wave, surrender, surrender. It, he gives me peace, and he gives me hope, and I have a destiny. I have a destiny. Tell the person next to you, I have a destiny. Go on, tell them. You can even get excited about it. I have a destiny. So we, we, we have seen, beloved, we have seen that when we, we should be holy, we should live in the light of, of what is going on. I should live in my destiny. I should be aware of things going on in the world. And I should use my time to witness. And finally, you'll be glad to hear, verse 18. What kind of people ought we to be? It says that we are to grow in grace and knowledge. How do I grow in grace and knowledge? Well, I think, first of all, through prayer. You know, that revival in India happened as the result of prayer. And prayer, prayer, prayer does change things. We, we experience, we say it, but we, we know. How, many, how Jamie would be encouraged tomorrow in the church prayer meeting if you turned up on Zoom and prayed with him. How he would be encouraged. And that's what prayer is all about, isn't it? It's praying. You know, there's only one time in the Bible where God is caught out by surprise. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. God was surprised that there was no one to fill the gap, that there was no one at prayer. And we need to pray. That's how we grow in grace and knowledge. We grow in grace and knowledge in fellowship. You may look around and say, well, it's not a really perfect church, but that's not perfect because we're in it. <laughs> and, and God wants us to be in this fellowship, and he wants us to, to, to meet and to talk and to share and to encourage and to build up and to ask for help and to give help. This is God's grace to us here in, in the fellowship. And he wants us to grow in his word. You know, I'm aware that more and more Christians are not able to read their Bibles. There's more and more persecution going on. And the Chinese Christians and the Christians that are suffering in the East hid the word of God in their hearts so that when the Bible was taken away from them, the word was still there. And that's what you and I, if you've got spare time and you don't know what to do with it, learn your Bible. Learn your Bible. Hide it in your heart. Be more Christ-aware that we are living in the days of Scripture being fulfilled. And that's not something to dis, dis, um, discourage us. 
It's something to encourage us. God foretold me that this would happen. So, closing thought. Here we go. You might have heard me using the word beloved. You might have heard me saying that. Let me tell you, let me tell you why I use it. When I, before I went into the ministry, I was a school teacher. And as a school teacher, you stand in front of the class, do this, do that, do, do, do it again, 20 lines, this and that. And when I was in college, the Lord had to remind me that the people I'm talking to are not a classroom, but God's beloved, that God loves them, that they are, they are God's special people. God loves you. Tell the person next to you, God loves you. God loves you and God cares for you. And, and God wants you to, to know that. God wants you to know that you are beloved. It's a bit like, it's not a very good example, but it's like a parent. You love your children. You love your children. But this is more than love. When I looked it up, it means adore. You love your children, but you adore your grandchildren. Yeah. <laughs> You love your children, but you adore your grandchildren. And, and, and God adores you. And that's amazing. But um, what's her name? Um, Julie reminded us a couple of weeks ago that this word is also double-edged. It's also a command as well. If I can get this right. Beloved becomes Beloved. And you and I need to accept that God loves you and you need to receive that love in your life. You need to be loved. You need to stop condemning yourself and, and your ways and see yourself through the eyes of God. God loves you. I'm going to finish there by... Inviting you to pray. We're going to pray. I'm aware my time is up, literally. Um, but I'm going to, we're going to do two prayers. I'm going to pray, first of all, for those of you who are Christians. And I'm going to ask you to make a commitment to rededicate your life to the Lord. To ask for boldness. To ask for an anticipation of what God is doing, to see it, to open your eyes that you might see the wonders of what God is doing in your life and recommit yourself to the Lord. And then I'm going to move on to anyone here that has not made that commitment to Jesus Christ. And I'm going to ask you to stand up and make a commitment to Jesus Christ. And, or if you may have made it, but you don't have the assurance to make the assurance of that, to make sure that you know on the 16th of July 2023 you gave your life to Jesus and I'm not going to ask you to come out here but after we've finished that prayer after we've finished the service I'm going to in invite you to come into the back Sunday school room and uh, Joyce and I and any other leaders that would want to come and join us will just very briefly share with you what it means to give your life to Jesus and how you do it. So, let's pray. I'm going to ask you, Christian, that if you are ready to recommit yourself to the Lord, to ask the Lord to give you strength, to ask the Lord to give you reality, I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. No one is looking, but stand where you are. Father God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters and I pray that, Lord, even as you have promised you will, we come to you, we come to your throne of grace. It's all of you and nothing of ourselves. Lord, we know that we fail you. We know that we forget you. But, Lord, you never fail us. You never forget us. In the name of Jesus, give us boldness, Lord. In the name of Jesus, help us to discern what is going on in the world. In the name of Jesus, help us, Lord, to walk in holiness and to resist the devil that he will flee from us. Help us, Lord, to see the things you want us to see. Oh, Lord, bless us and use us to be a blessing. We pray that we may be a blessed people, blessing others. 
And I'm going to ask, whilst we're standing, any others that would like to stand who need to give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to stand and we will pray for you as well. Father God, I thank you for those that have stood and pray that, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would show them that the reality of your love, the reality that you love them so much that you gave Jesus, that you adore them, that you care for them, that, Lord, they don't have to help themselves. It's all of your grace. And, Lord, I thank you for the work of your Spirit here today. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Bless you.